For the first time in South Africa's history, individual people, independent candidates are running for public office. They're allowed to now. You don't have to join a political party and then cam campaign for the party and hope that the party gets enough votes so they get seats in parliament. And then maybe you'll be picked from within your party to get one of those seats. No, none of that mess. The laws have been changed. And now individual people, if they pass a series of requirements before election day to actually get registered and eligible, individual people will be on your ballot and you'll be able to vote for them. But in a country where there's been so much debate in the last six to 12 months about new parties, smaller parties. Am I wasting my vote if I vote for a smaller party? What will they really be able to do in parliament? There's an even more intense debate about like, what's the point? of voting for an independent candidate. Just one person, just one member of parliament in no way able to gather a majority within their own grouping or movement or party to push things through. But a massive, massive argument is developed for it that independent candidates are more free. They can make more hay, basically. They can cause more trouble for the big parties because they are untethered and unbound by the dictates, the decrees and the interests of a whole political party that they would otherwise be a part of. And so now South Africa is about to do a massive experiment is independent candidates a good thing? It will it work out, will it be helpful to our politics. And it seems like the one person in South Africa who many people believe, if anyone is going to make it, because it's really hard, right? It's really expensive and it's really hard. You need to get tens of thousands of votes for just you. But right now, the whole country believes that if anybody is going to do it, Zaki Ahmad is going to do it. Zaki Ahmad is a legend fighting for social justice. He has dedicated his life to elevating the voices and fighting for the rights of marginal disempowered, ignored people. He was part of the ANC back in the day. Then he quit. He was part of the Treatment Action Campaign. He was part of Equal Education, Difuna Okwazi, Unite Behind, all of these organizations trying to hold government accountable and get people's rights looked after in South Africa. So in our exclusive interview with Zaki Ahmad, we find out more about him for those who are interested in maybe voting for him and ask him, what is the point? Is it even a good idea to be an independent candidate, to have independent candidates, and to vote for independent candidates? This is The Issue with Dan Corder. South Africa is a movie. Welcome to the watch party. Go check out the podcast, of course, if you haven't. Pop a subscribe if you want to support the channel. It costs you nothing and helps us keep, right now, only one light on. Uh, the other light's being a bit wavy, but we'll fix that. Right, let's talk to Zaki Ahmad. Let's get uh, a clap. clap from Eric, are you ready? Cool. Yeah. cool. Now for you, Zaki. Is that for yourself? <laughs> Saki Ahmad is here! Make some noise! Cool, can I go? Zaki Ahmad, it's such a delight. I always invite people to wear a beanie on the show. I left the core cast in Johannesburg, for which I will be vilified in the comments. Yes, indeed. But I've got this very beautiful beanie that my girlfriend bought me from the Netherlands. So if you'd like to wear it, it's yours. Has any other politician worn it? No. All right, You're excellent. The one and only. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. Um, many, many, many Let me politicians. give you a sartorial challenge. Oh. What is... I'll wear it. Of course I will. Of course I will. Can I put it on now? Yeah, go for it. Excellent. Zaki Ahmed, thank you so much for your time. You are, as far as the uh, mainstream media, but also anybody I've spoken to across the country, you are the only independent candidate in the first year where independent candidates can run for public office and even the highest levels of parliament as an MP. MP. You're the only one running who anybody is talking about. In fact, when people think about independent candidacies, they think, oh, that's the thing Zaki Ahmed is doing. Why is it so significant that individual people can run for positions of power in South Africa now? Before I take myself too seriously, this is like the last thing on earth I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> so the constitution guarantees two things that are critical for democracy. Participatory democracy, allowing people to participate in democracy during, between elections, not for elections and participatory gov governance. And participatory governance is you help the city council understand what the needs are, or you oppose it. Sure. And, and, and so that is important. For me, the reason I'm standing is because 29% of people in 2021 believe that they could trust political parties. Yeah. 29%. It's not a local phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon because in Britain it is 12%. Wow. Right, so representative democracy is in deep crisis across the world. You have authoritarianism from 
uh, Modi, Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, across our continent, Uganda, Museveni, and so on. So parties have played a major role in that disaffection of the massive people, working class, rural, and so on. So for me, I've only ever belonged to the ANC and the Marxist workers' tendency of the ANC. I've not belonged to any other party. And quite frankly, I, I think the ANC never democratized itself. And most of the other parties aren't democratic. So if I go to parliament, I have two connections, two things that I have to fulfill. One is represent the people, all the people in the country, but specifically the people who elected me. Secondly, I only have the constitution to guide me. Sure. I don't have a political party to tell me what to do. And I believe that all MPs should act in that way, even if they belong to a political party. For sure. We cannot get rid of political parties. That's how many people want to be represented, their interests collectively and so on. But for me, it's about building a movement at the same time. So that I'm opening the door for people like you. I'd like to see you in parliament, in the cultural committee. It's extremely kind. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a podcast all the time in the committee. Um, I want to open the door for other people to get into parliament. Sure. But there are huge obstacles, but we can talk about the obstacles later. Yeah, so I'm now going to give you, I don't know if you have LinkedIn. Uh, I hope you don't, but... I think I have one. <laughs> but I'm going I've to... I've never used it really. I'm going to give... In fact, I think kids are now using ChatGPT, but when I was in university, it was SparkNotes. If you didn't have time to read the whole book that you had to write a test on, you would read the, the summary. Right. So I'm going to give the SparkNotes of Zaki Ahmad, yeah. and then I'm going to let you describe yourself in relation to that. And I'm sure I'll miss things and you must tell me off. Just so people who've not heard of you will know... Which are a lot of people, by the way. Especially but people over under 40. But there are many people, there are enough people that know you that you are a serious uh, candidate for the independent seat, the owner, well, the first person to, to probably do so in South Africa. So, Zaki Ahmad, uh, you were born and raised in Johannesburg, you just told me, although between Johannesburg and Cape Town. That's right, mainly yeah. in Cape Town. Let's make right. this a dialogue so I don't fuck it up. Uh, <laughs> mainly in Cape Town. Um, you have always been part of a variety of different movements trying to get social justice. You were a sex worker for a while. Absolutely. Um, you, you were uh, sorry you remain hiv positive and so a massive part of your campaigning work has been with the treatment action campaign where a lot of people know you from which was an extraordinary movement and it must have been very interesting for you because the treatment action campaign in the in the 2000s existed to get people at arvs and to force the government which is an anc government which would have been very interesting for you as a card carrying anc member to force them to take the crisis seriously, to help people. You've also worked on equal education, which is incredibly important. You're in the Marxist wing of the ANC. And now you are this iconic, I would say, activist of struggle. So not a struggle activist, although you were one against apartheid, but struggling for the injustices, against the injustices that exist across South Africa for a variety of different people. What did I miss or get wrong? Well, first, that I'm queer. Mm. Atheist, Mm. uh, and I regard myself still as a socialist, although I'm much more of a social democrat, um, but everyone describes himself as social democratic still. For me, the the critical thing to know about me politically, what you need to know about me politically, you don't know me unless you know the movements that I've worked in. For sure. So if you want... My, to know my politics and to know me politically, you have to know the movements that I'm working. And right now as an independent candidate, the movements that I'm help, helping to build. Uh, I love Foucault. Oh, good. <laughs> I l- love Trotsky. Excellent. Um, I love uh, Pablo Neruda's poetry and Garcia Lorca. Until the campaign or just a little bit before it, I couldn't go to sleep at night without reading a poem. Wow. Whether it's Wally Sienka, whether it is, mm. you know, Eugene Marais, sure. whether it's Mary, what's her name? Uh, Ingrid Juncker, mm. um, a whole range of poets. Mm. Uh, so those are the things that people don't know about me. Okay, well, excellent. Now, your campaign is essentially trying to get you into parliament as an independent candidate. But there have been many people who've coalesced around you to try and support your candidacy. You've got this 
frankly, unbelievably beautiful iconography. It says equality for all. Can I just ask, when you think about the NGOs, the NPOs, and the social justice organizations that you want to be judged by in terms of who you've represented, what are the key ones? So Treatment Action Campaign is about health and access to healthcare. Each Equal education about access to education. What right. others? The Social Justice Coalition, mm -hmm. which was about informal settlements and, and, and safety. And then... And uh, Quasi, which was uh, access to information, uh, which was about access to information, but particularly about urban land justice. And you might not know this, but I've helped organize occupations. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I also think um, the National Coalition for Gain Lesbian Equality yeah. was central to my work at the beginning of 1994. I was a I was the first opponent in a civil society organization or a coalition sure. that sued the ANC government huh. for the decriminalization of As Sodom. a card carrying As member. a card, of course, wow, of course, amazing. of course. Okay. I, I sincerely believe that if you're a member of the political party and the political party in government acts improperly, mm. you have a duty to act on your conscience or on the basis of the constitution. Sure. So you are what uh, people in the establishment call annoying. Um, <laughs> why do you, what do you think you could do in parliament as an independent candidate that currently doesn't exist in parliament? This is critical. Um, as I mentioned, participatory democracy is essential. Mm. Now, who's your constituency MP at the moment? I have no idea. Do you know that one exists for you? I do abstractly. <laughs> All right. So political parties have allocated, parliament has allocated constituencies to more than 350 MPs. They get money to run those constituency offices. Every Monday morning, they should report to their constituency offices and work with their constituents. Most people in the country, I think almost everybody, don't know their name, mm. the name of the MP. They might abstractly know which party rules their area. Yeah, yeah. they know, they know which, which, which party. Every political party in parliament currently, and people who were in parliament before MPs, leaders of parties, they know that they abused, irregularly spent their constituency allowances on running their political parties not serving constituents. So my duty is, part of what I'm doing is building a movement. So we've got an Amateur Chombe Forum, which is independent of the campaign, but which the campaign now supports. Sure. A Disability Activist Forum, Queer Revolution. I signed a contract with, the queer, with queer Revolution last night. Um, Youth in Action, um, who has the best slogan, we are not the future, we are now. Mm. Um, so from where I'm sitting, the people who are supporting me are neighborhood watchers, people in community kitchens and so on. The ability that an independent MP has to bring those people's voices into parliament, to say to a parliament, you have to listen to uh, Boniswa uh, Selenga, who's legs are about to be amputated, mm. who cannot get into a wheelchair because the shack is narrow, and she's been sitting in Kiki, an informal settlement, since 1993. Yeah. So for Parliament to hear her voice is critical. And that was what was great about the first Parliament, that the first Parliament brought people in. It asked, it ring you up, the MPs would ring you up and say, Zaki, can you bring people who can talk about employment equity or the sure. Medical Schemes Act or sure. about HIV? Or This was 1994, 19, up to 1999. They would say, do you know a progressive expert that we can listen to? Yeah. Right? So suddenly you had a, a parliament that linked itself to people. And because it was also the period of the Constituent Assembly that wrote the final constitution, MPs went to the communities. In that way, I would like to work in that way, but I also have a different example. Helen Sussman. She almost dressed like Jackie Anassas, but not quite. So <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't follow her clothing <laughs> advice. But imagine this. You're the only woman, you're Jewish, in a parliament 
of christelijke nationale mannen mm. were all over 50. Yeah. 50 was the, their youth league age. It's not di- dissimilar to the ANC? Of course, of course. Of course <laughs> no, the problem. ANC looks like it's going to 60. If I look back on that period and I look what happened immediately afterwards, sure. the minute Mbeki came to power, he sent that thug Issa Pahad to be the minister in the presidency and to rule the caucus of the ANC. Sure. Becky established a newsletter called ANC Today. There are two points I'd like to make about that newsletter. The first issue dealt with the arms deal. Now, who was opposing the arms deal at that time? Most of his party, the Communist Party, Kasatu, the churches, all of us were opposing the arms deal. He gets rid of um, Judge Heath, uh, turns out that it was right that the judge shouldn't be doing that job. But he says, anyone who says the arms deal is corrupt is a racist who doesn't believe that black, black people can govern, who believes that if black people govern, they are corrupt. And with that, he silenced Andrew Feinstein, Prex Governor, Barbara Hogan, and most of the ANC uh, caucus. Mm-hmm. And so you have that moment, and then you have the moment where Parliament's worst action linked now to state capture is that it allowed hundreds of thousands of people to die and millions of people to become infected with HIV and millions to get sick with AIDS-related illnesses. When Parliament would cheer, Mm -hmm. when Becky said, a virus can't cause a syndrome. Yeah. And HIV is a virus, it can't cause a syndrome. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to read. So at that point, those two things linked together with Hitachi, mm. the deal to build Kusile and Mdupi, those deals sealed the independent role that MPs had in Parliament to hold the executive accountable. And from there, it was downhill to Fikile saying, we turned a, f- a swimming pool into a fire pool. We instructed our yeah. MPs to do it. Yeah. And they did. Yeah. They did. They even went there and pretended. Harry Potter. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's true. So here we have a situation now. You had Helen Sussman. What did she do when she was in the apartheid parliament? She did the following. She served on the Justice Committee. She made sure that uh, everyone knew who was being detained. Everyone knew how many people were being detained for past laws or not convicted for past laws. These are the things she made known. I don't share her politics at all. Mm. But she was a lone MP who did phenomenal work. So the question is not that I will be alone because I will work with other MPs, I will work with movements. Julius Malema said, on the other hand, I hear Zaki Ahmad is coming to parliament. Let him come. He will find it boring. Sure. Sure. We have 44 superior intellects and we can't change parliament's views. Now, this is not true because I love boring works. My ex-husband... One of the reasons he divorced me was because I prefer reading judgments in bed (laughs) at night than cuddling, (laughs) right? Now, I love boring work. I can read 200,000 pages on an issue like I've done with Prasa recently over the last seven years. Love it. I love detail. So for me to work in a committee collegially with anyone who wishes to pass a piece of legislation that is good, I can do that. Sure. I love the boring work. As much as you think I'm a drama queen on television <laughs> everywhere, on going to prison here, <laughs> sitting in there, organizing an occupation. Sure. For me, it's the hard work of education, research, and studying. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on your website, uh, you describe a couple of committees you love to work in. A couple of them are finance committees so that you can oversee the way that government expends money. Um, a lot of people in South Africa say, we don't have a... We don't have too little money 
the tax revenue service had a, b a few rough years, but it's largely fine and we have enough money. It's fruitless and wasteful and corrupt expenditure that is a problem in South Africa. But there are a lot of people who talk about, in fact, they don't even talk about independence like this. They talk about, they talk about tiny parties as a wasted vote. Yeah. And I think independence an even more extreme version of that. I really want to know, and I'm sure everybody wants to know specifically, what can you do alone in parliament? Can you guarantee getting on a committee? Can you guarantee that you will be able to speak in parliament and shout on TV at the bad people? Can you make your presence felt? Because for most, for all of South Africa, we've never seen an independent candidate. So we don't even realistically know what you can prompt. Or I know you say you don't make promises on your website, but like what can you definitely what do? What I'm going to do. What, you, what are you definitely going to do? What I'm going to do. Okay. In the first month that I get into parliament, I'm going to revive the amendment to the liquor bill. And that amendment, if we think of Enyobeni and what happened in East London, the largest substance use disorder in our country is alcoholism. And it causes most of the violence, it causes most of the car crashes, the stabbings, anything you wish, to, domestic violence for on sure. a large scale. For sure. So for me, the fact that that amendment that says ban alcohol advertising, I'm sorry, your podcast is not going to get uh, lager, we, we lager don't, for, we, I'm teasing They you. don't want to talk to <laughs> <laughs> We're not right? fun. We don't have enough so, rugby. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so for me, the, the critical question is the banning of advertising everywhere related to alcohol. Secondly, the fact that people shouldn't sell alcohol in the vicinity of schools. Yeah. All the political parties have let that amendment, which they all agreed on, languish for the last eight years. Okay. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I cannot guarantee that I can serve on any committee. But a member of parliament has the right to go to any committee. Sure. And you have the right to ask questions in those committees and contribute to the discussion. You're just not allowed to vote. For sure. But you can get busy. But critically, what I want to do is study, let's say, the Prasa report, because fixing the state is critical to what I believe we all need to do. Let's say we, this uh, Prasa audited report comes out. The first thing I would do is go and study it with people in Unite Behind and any commuter organization and anyone who wishes to do it so that I can hear what people think about it. And then go to the committee, sure. ask people to come. So that's the type of work I want to do in public. For sure. The other problem of parliaments, uh, of being an independent in parliament that people often raise is, can you change policy? First, I'm not joining a government. Mm. So I don't need to have a manifesto. I have a little manifesto, right? And that manifesto it relates to fixing the state. I commit to working on SCOPA if I can. That's the Standing Committee on Public Accounts that check where all our money is going, sure. how it's being spent. On that committee, I want to focus on commuter rail services. Right now, you know that Unite Behind, which I help co-found with Zuki Vuka and many other people, we've, for the last seven years, been to court against Prasa for 10 years. Yeah. We, for 10, 10 times. We're in court right now against Parliament. In fact, the Speaker was cited in one of our cases. Oh, she's gone now. <laughs> what a pity. I would have liked to see her affidavit. <laughs> um, but it's right that she's gone. The, if I said to you these names, Roy Mudley, mm -hmm. Mario Ferreira, um, Vosla Ismania, uh, uh, Mackenza Mabunda, mm -hmm. Uh, Ozul Mashaba. Um, uh, I did say Sophia Sabatelezi. I can name a lot more. What does that bring to you? I, I actually only recognize Roy Mudley's name. Yeah. Which one? Roy Mudley. Roy Mudley. Yeah. Right. Now, Sophia Sabatelezi is the chair of the Standing Committee on Appropriations. There's an architecture of three committees finance, which sets the whole architecture of banks sure. and, and um, state expenditure, expenditure and so on. Then you have the Standing Committee of Appropriations, which I think is one of the most important parliamentary uh, committees because it looks at where budgets should be allocated. Sure. 
The last one is the Standing Committee on Public Accounts that checks where the money's gone. He chairs that committee, but what is his history? He destroyed Robben Island. Sure. He was Zuma's economic ad ad advisor when Zuma was uh, MEC for uh, uh, develop uh, economic development in KZN. He then became a board member of the South African Rail Commuter Corporation. He then became the first chairperson and served the longest as chairperson of Prasa. Sure. People fall up. He has milked Prasa and he's allowed the ANC to milk Prasa. He's allowed every corrupt crook locally and globally sure. to steal. Sure. But the ANC, and when Zuma did his nighttime shuff, uh, uh, cabinet shuffle, weekend special. Weekend special. He accompanied Weekend Special to become Deputy Minister. Interesting. And he stayed there because Treasury was investigating him. Okay. Okay. I need so you. for me, going to Parliament is to assist in fixing the state by exposing corruption and by looking at what can be done to fix it. I can't do that alone. I have to do it with a movement. I have to work with other MPs to do so. Second is... Focusing on Sasa. Why? Income security is a critical issue in the country, and every time a pensioner has to stand in the queue for 12 hours yeah. and then be told, come back tomorrow, mm -hmm. she feels that her income is destroyed. Sure. Right? The third area for me is energy. Now, one great thing that Panyaza Le Sufi did just before the election is he pushed city power and the city of Joburg, mm -hmm. to finish um, a, a solar installation in Alex mm -hmm. with a mini-grid for 500 household, informal settlement households. Mm -hmm. Now, what that shows is, I'm not talking about Eskom corruption, all that mess now, but that the city of Cape Town is spending a lot of money on uh, ensuring energy, solutions, energy yeah. solutions, that every metro should find ways to have those microgrids that connect people who are not connected to the grid and to take people, poor working class people, and give them access to the, that sure. electricity. Sure. That's uh, something I want to champion. Sure. Every single political organization and party says they want to fix South Africa, they want to root out corruption, and they want to solve the energy crisis. And I'm not criticizing you for wanting to fix those things because those are obviously the things that we need to fix. But I wonder for somebody considering who to vote for, because I know that specifically you'll be on the Western Cape regional ballot. That's right. So unfortunately for everybody who's just listened to you wax lyrical, lol, poetical for 30 minutes, who's not in Cape Town, I'm sorry if you I'm love ready Zaki. To sleep. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you won't be able to. It's not waxing lyrical. Uh, it's a peroration. I, I don't have. I didn't attend class enough um, <laughs> in university. You didn't but do English literature, right? I did, but but ah, only terrible p past presently. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so so Zaki, what I want to know is this: you are going to be uh, assuming you get elected, um, a thorn in the side of everybody. And you're going to make it difficult for everybody in a way that they cannot control because you are not, you will not be governed by the interrelations of agreements between parties. Why would any other politician or indeed the party who has to approve of their behavior choose to work with you? I think having a movement outside will assist them to come to a good understanding of why we need to work together. Sure. Also, I think finding the right experts, like we did in HIV, like we did with Urban Land Justice, yeah. bringing their voices into Parliament will assist people in changing their views. L last thing that comes is go to court to get it done, mm. right? I'm not afraid to do that, but that should be the second last resort. The last resort is, of course, civil disobedience. Mm. But it should be the last resort because we're overburdening our courts with policy issues. Sure. For me, the important thing, I will not directly go into a coalition, but I would love to have an agreement with a coalition that supports the rule of law, that is anti-corrupt and commits to enforcing uh, anti-corruption laws and to ensure that they act in the interest of the working class. Now, 
if such a coalition comes about mm -hmm. with two or three, all three of those uh, conditions, I would agree with them to keep them in power for three years, sure. to have national stability, because then what politicians are not telling you mm. and not discussing is our country is on the verge of an incipient civil war. In KwaZulu-Natal, sure. I lived through the 80s and 90s when someone couldn't get on the train in Soweto on the East Rand without imagining that they were going to be shot or hacked to death by the IFP. Now, at the moment, the ANC is fighting with the IFP and MK. The IFP is fighting with the ANC. Maybe they will fight with MK too. MK wants to fight the whole country. Yep. In the Western Cape, we have an even more, not an even more, we have a very dangerous system, uh, a situation developing. It is the anti-color, it's the anti-black African racism that is being encouraged within the colored community, of which I'm part. What is being done is the colored congress is saying everyone who came here after 1994 from the Eastern Cape must be sent back. Yeah. How are you going to do that? Yeah. But it's whipping up the worst and basest instincts that we have. They're supported by the Freedom Front Plus. Sure. And they're supported by the Patriotic Alliance. So you have a hard core of racists, supremacists, who want to replace white supremacy with colored supremacy. And the danger that we face is no political party that's standing in this election have taken on those people. Sure. For me, the only way to change the country is to build working class unity. Yeah. That's the only way to change it. For sure. I hear you. So uh, you say you're going to go to parliament. You need more than 80,000 votes. You're only going to be on the regional va ballot in the Western Cape at large, yes? Correct. And... Um, one very sad thing about, well, there are many frustrating, difficult things about South Africa, but one of them that pains me is that our polling industry is rubbish. It's so small, it's so underfunded, there are not enough polling uh, institutions or whatever, and some of them do some fine work. But when there's a lack of money and a lack of scrutiny and a lack of competition, you, uh, many of the smaller parties and individuals don't show up on polling. Exactly. Which means that mainstream media, which follows the polling because they they believe they must just talk about who people are talking about and care about so they get the clicks and the views. They don't speak to the little people right. at all. So we actually, neither do you, by the way. Uh, on your show, <laughs> you need to get someone with disability. You That's need true. To get, that is absolutely true. You need to true. get people who live in communities I totally so you can you. In, uh, have a discussion with them. Please don't forget to put this in. No, I will put this in. We don't leave things out when people criticize me at all. I love it. Um, but um, I completely agree with you. So now we actually have no idea how well you're going to do because right. there is no polling. Right. And it's very hard to trust anybody's hot takes on anything. But you need to get more than 80,000 votes. Right. And you reckon you're going to do it. I know that you've got incredible name power, actually. You've got bona it's not fides. Name, it's not name power, name power that's doing this work. Okay. It is, this is what I want to hear. It's the poorest people in informal settlements. Sure. It is queer activists. It's people living with disability. It is neighborhood watchers and women working. In but you have inspired them to believe that this is worth their time through your credentials. So That's right. maybe star power is the wrong word, but credentials of many decades making people believe yeah. I'll stand with Zaki yeah. Ahmad. 30% yeah. uh, of the people in my campaign are people who were 14, 15, 16 year olds when the treatment when they would join the treatment action campaign. Interesting. Many of the younger people, not a lot, but quite a few, mm. are children whose mothers took antiretrovirals and they didn't get HIV. Interesting. But they know of the battles that led to it. Sure. So that's very important to me. But the reason people in the Tigerberg district, which is Guguletu, Nyanga, Langa, Philippi, Lower Crossroads, Crossroads, then in the Kailetsha district, and in the Tigerberg district, Elsie's River, Easter Refere, and so on, what people there want is knowledge. Mm. My campaign is not one where the great leader comes and makes a speech, shakes hands, kisses the babies, although I have to do that. Mm. Right? Some babies are cute. 
<laughs> have you ever seen babies when they're born? They, I just did. They're not very pretty. <laughs> they're not very pretty. Sure. It's when they get, get to about six months That's and true. so that, they, that they're quite cute. But anyway, so people want knowledge. Mm. They want to know what's in Section 195 of the Constitution. What does a public service need to look like? Professional, ethical, open, accountable. That's what the Constitution wants. Yeah. People want to know how the Municipal Systems Act works and how councils need to treat them. They want to know about the Equality Act. They want to know the data of the budgets. Right now, the ANC is promising millions of jobs, but what it's doing, the EPWP in this city mm -hmm. has been cut by 60% by national government, and I'm sure it's happened across the country. Mm. The social development budget for the province has been cut by 620 million rand, leaving uh, women's organizations, disabled people's organizations, children's organizations without money. Sure. So in a situation like that, people need to have the knowledge, and that's what my campaign is about. Thank you so much for watching The Issue with Dan Corder, this special episode exclusive with Zaki Ahmad. Let us know what you think of him and what he's trying to achieve and whether or not you think it'll be effective if he does get into parliament. And also let us know, having listened to and watched this for the last little while, let us know what you now think about independent candidates, whether it's a good idea, whether it's a, an effective means of using a parliamentary seat and whether it's a good idea to use your vote to support independent candidates. We'll see you on Thursday.